inside of the uh, chapter on recording and music. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of genres and popular music, and I'm specifically talking about it from a U.S. perspective. If you were to look at this from another country's perspective, you're going to kind of see it evolve differently. I just want to be super clear about that and that um, this is how kind of the cultural landscape of the U.S. has shaped popular music in the U.S. and vice versa. And there's a relationship between the music that we listen to, the music that is uh, sold in large quantities, listened to in large quantities, and our culture at the time. This is, again, part of the reason we're looking at media is that media can tell us about culture as much as it is shaping culture. So I also want to be really clear about what I'm talking about when I say pop music, because pop music is in itself a genre. But it's also just music that is popular. So it's something that's going to appeal to a wide cross-section of the public or a sizable subdivision within the public. So this can be different based on your age, religious, ethnic background. And I want to be clear that what was classed as pop music 50, 100 years ago would be unrecognizable to us today. And the reason that I'm noting that I'm really grounding this in America and American music is that this can differ by country. Even within English speaking countries, when I go uh, to the UK to visit my friends there, their concept of pop music is different from my as an American growing up definition and concept of pop music. So just to be, you know, very honest and transparent about what we're going to be talking about and what we're going to focus on is how the intersection of music that is popular, that is listened to a wide range of people, um, both reflects the culture and shapes the culture within the U.S. during the time period that it is, in fact, popular. Um, also, this is an area that clearly I am interested in, so I will talk more at length. So I do apologize. So popular music, as we understand it, started with Tin Pan Alley, because at that point, we're able to publish sheet music and to pass it around. So now, even before we are having recorded music being played regularly in people's homes, the same song can be played the same way um, across the country. And it's readily available. Obviously, you could have scores that people would, you know, bring back and forth, but, you know, they were handwritten. It was, wasn't able to be kind of broadcast across the country easily. So as we start getting phonographs put into people's homes, we're starting to listen to music so we don't have to then recreate it by playing the sheet music. And the people who made phonographs were really caught off guard by the fact that um, this music was catching on and that people wanted to use the phonograph to listen to music. So this is what helps popular music go from being just something that's played in a music hall, played as background noise, to being something that's an art form that people want to listen to, uh, kind of elevates it as a mass medium. And we start finding that genres of music that certainly existed and were being played are suddenly having more attention given to them. So they're suddenly being consumed by people outside of people in jazz clubs, outside of people in bars, uh, outside of the, at times, very localized areas that these subsets of genres are popping up in. And suddenly we can consume them in other areas. So we've got jazz is popping up in like New Orleans and we get a real boom of creativity from it. But if you are in, we're going to talk about Detroit in a little bit and how we bring in soul music. Well, if you were in Detroit, you might not be able to hear jazz music as it was being played by, since it's improvisational, people in New Orleans, um, without being able to distribute music through phonograms and then through vinyl. A lot of this popular music, this is going to be a common refrain, is going to be emerging from black communities and then is going to be um, popularized by white musicians and kind of normalized and um, kind of sensitized by white musicians bringing it into white communities. But a lot of the creativity, a lot of the emergence of this music is coming from black communities. 
So cover songs, for example, cover songs become very popular um, up to like the 1950s. And we get things like rock and roll starting to become popular where you're going to have the same song is going to be covered by multiple artists. And what you'll often find is that it'll be black creators. But then when the white artists cover the songs, that's when you get the most popular versions that are then distributed widely, especially on the radio. So again, when Elvis starts off, when Johnny Cash starts off, these guys are covering um, music that's created by somebody else. And it's their versions that become popular. And oftentimes you would have multiple versions on the charts at the same time. This starts becoming less of a thing in the 1950s. But up until then, you know, you would have a different version. You might have three versions of the same song on the top 10 at the same time. Again, blues is influenced by African-American spirituals. Again, it starts off in the South and then it spreads um, into urban and northern environments. Blues is the foundation of rock and roll. And blues then obviously is part of rhythm and blues as well as rock and roll. And again, rock and roll really starts when a uh, bunch of white guys decide that they're going to play this black music to respectable white audiences. Um, but blues also obviously is part of R&B. R&B stands for rhythm and blues, although we generally see it as a genre as R&B now. And again, it's going to be taking that blues music and kind of infusing it from an urban environment rather than a rural environment. It became more popular with teens. Um, and R&B really was kind of the beginning of the integration between black and white cultures. Again, rock and roll is black music played to white audiences. Uh, it was made for white people. R&B isn't necessarily made for white people. Uh, and so it's black music that might be popular with a white audience, but it hasn't been divorced from its original setting. It's interesting then to look at how R&B has been popularized over the years. So if you look at someone like Aretha Franklin, who was the first women R&B artist to win an award, uh, women's roles in R&B were kind of downplayed despite the fact that they were popular um, until later than for men. Um, there's definitely issues around people like Michael Jackson with the Jackson 5. They were very popular within R&B. But as Michael Jackson became popular on his own and branched out more into quote unquote pop music, he felt like he had to become white. He wanted to kind of play, not consciously, but he was playing into power structures around him that uh, basically he would kind of, you know, get good responses from people when he played into those white power structures. And again, the songs like Man in the Mirror, which focused on struggling children and issues around the world and how he's grappling with those own issues within himself. Um, and obviously there are issues around, um, again, when we're looking at women and how they were maybe not traditionally um, given credit within R&B, but now in more contemporary situations they are and that they are celebrated just as much. We still have continuing issues where you have artists like Chris Brown, who obviously um, had domestic assault charges, but there's the issue that we face in all media of can you, should you, do you divorce the person who creates the piece of art from the art itself? So, you know, it's something that everyone grapples with when you turn turns out that maybe something that you love a piece of music a book that you really enjoy a movie that you love um, was created by someone who has done some terrible things how does that then impact and inflict inflect your understanding of the original piece of art in terms of rock and roll we took the black sounds of rhythm and blues. We got gospel in there. We could have that blues guitar, really creative, really creative, lots of creativity. But we're taking white influences like country, folk, and pop vocals and merging them together. And to be clear, especially in the beginning, 
it is made by white people for a white audience. And so there is certainly um, a playing with taboos of integration, especially in the 1950s. Um, but it was white people capitalizing on black music and black creativity. And it isn't until later on that uh, the black community is able to be able to capitalize themselves and be able to make money back. You would have black session musicians, but they're paid a pittance. Elvis, Elvis makes tons of money, but the musicians who helped him create the sound get hardly anything. And when he's going to tour, he has to tour with white people. So it kind of is this ongoing issue of uh, equity within the music industry. So rock and roll, obviously, itself goes through various evolutions and various iterations. Um, you know, oldies rock and roll doesn't sound the same as contemporary rock and roll. But in general, rock and roll is also going to follow the same social, cultural, political factors that the rest of um, the U.S. and the rest of um, society is kind of grappling with. So it's muddying the water between high and low culture. It's muddying the water between um, black and white culture. It's muddying the water between masculinity and femininity. It seems ridiculous to us now to say that people looked at Elvis Presley and were like, oh my God, he's being like, he's bringing in feminine movement into um, male masculine culture and, you know, that he's, he's blurring lines between feminine and masculinity. But at the time, his hip gyrations are a very feminine, very stylized way of moving that was seen as bringing in feminine sexuality into a masculine music genre which I know now we would think that that's super tame, but it got him banned from certain places because it was considered sensual. Um, and then, again, people like Little Richard who would play up his feminine side. So we would now consider that incredibly tame, but at the time, it wasn't. It was considered very daring. Uh, we also muddy the water between the country and the city, uh, between what is urban and what is um, rural. And you get things like rockabilly, which merges kind of country sounds, um, southern gospel sounds, Mississippi Delta blues with this rock and roll urban. Rock and roll is very, again, a very urban sound, uh, merging them together. So rock attempts to continually kind of find boundaries and push them. And you'll find that in the other subgenres of rock that we're going to talk about, that there's constantly this finding the edge and trying to push it, uh, whatever that edge might be. It's also going to muddy waters between the North and the South. Um, you're often bringing in, especially at the beginning, we're talking about, you know, Elvis Presley's from the South. Um, when we're talking about blues, that's very originally rooted in South Southern music gospel rooted in the south um but it becomes popular with listeners in the north so we're then exposing northern listeners to southern culture um the key to spreading rock and roll at the time was finding a white man who sounded black great um it also mixed the sacred and the secular so again we've got gospel music blues music is rooted in traditional uh ballads and working songs these things that were tied very much to the culture that was rooted in their church and their christianity but we're taking that and we're using it for a very secular purpose and again if you're sexualizing it if you're using it to push boundaries and to muddy these waters it's going to be seen as profane so this is a way that rock is seen as, again, it, it's banned in certain places at certain times because it was seen as taking this thing that was rooted in religion and just defiling it. Um, but we have, rock does gain acceptance. And while there is a continual pushing of boundaries, there's also a continual um, kind of moving of that line of where then it becomes acceptable then it becomes um kind of palatable to your average middle-aged middle-class white listener 
uh, where it's basically been appropriated to the point that it loses any of its edginess. It becomes the um, Bonnaroo um, party goer who can wear the culture of another person and not even realize that they're wearing somebody's culture. So Dick Clark, who, you know, up until, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago was still rocking New Year's Eve, um, was one of the DJs on the radio who really started to try to make rock mainstream, try to make it acceptable, try to make it palatable to our mainstream audience. That, yes, it's breaking down these conventional boundaries, but they have enough conventionality, enough that is palatable to the average listener, um, that you can capitalize on that edginess, that you can take the edginess and make it something that you can make money from, that you can use it to um, kind of sell this lifestyle that um, while you are in fact a middle-aged, middle-class, middle-American um White man, if you listen to this, you are actually an edgy um, James Dean anti-hero. So again, we've got these white cover versions of um, black songs that are going to undermine black artists' royalties and their ability to make money off of their music, but that popularizes it within society in America and allows it to become popular. Now, for all of its pushing of boundaries, um, that doesn't mean that it's actually this great democratic, you know, stick it to the man genre of music. Because we had, still have, the music industry as a massive player in the distribution of music. And it is in their best interest to have their music distributed far and wide via radio, via vinyl records, and tapes and CDs and via streaming services and digitally download digital downloads. Now, with radio being free and popular and becoming a mass media, um, people, until we get into the digital age, discovered new music through the radio more than any other source. So people in the music industry paid off DJs to play their music. It's not illegal, but it's highly unpalatable. And so uh, it became a scandal that made the music industry look corrupt, um, made radio look corrupt, and kind of discredited um, a large section of um, kind of the credibility of rock and roll and... um, that idea that they are, you know, independent and, you know, sticking it to the man. We also have, again, the, we're talking about the, those lines and where society was. In the 1950s, when rock and roll is first breaking in, there's this fear of the juvenile delinquent. So while you're selling to the average person this idea that you're listening to rock and roll and it makes you a rebel... There are people who legitimately think that rock and roll is going to ruin America and that it's going to turn us all into these savage people who are going to just loot and pillage and burn down everything. Clearly that didn't happen, but you have this recurring theme of, oh, what about the children? And as we have people, (coughs) excuse me, uh, decrying all of these media as ruining people, Rock and roll gets wrapped up in that. So that's the 1950s. And then we get into the 1960s where rock and roll developed um, over in the UK parallel to in the US. So while we have Elvis over here, you've got the Rolling Stones in the UK. Now in the 60s, we start bringing in, we start importing our rock and roll from abroad. And it becomes this massive explosion. And this is where rock and roll becomes rock, rock music. And we kind of have this schism between pop music and rock music in the 60s. And 
we start having different sounds for them. So some of these names are more or less familiar to you, depending on um, what you listen to and what your parents listen to. Um, but in a way, taking the UK's version of rock became safer for us in the US because it's one more level removed from the roots of where we're getting rock. And so we feel more comfortable with it. Um, pop music actually holds on to more of the original roots through R&B of um, kind of what started rock and roll. Uh, but we have this schism between pop and rock that appears in the U.S. And it is a rather U.S. invention. Uh, when I lived in the U.K., most of my friends did not see a huge divide between this person's a rock musician and this person's a pop musician. So this is where America decides we are separating these two. Now, when we get into the 70s, we get soul music. We start getting uh, Detroit and places up in this kind of industrial um, Midwestern North bringing their own unique sound. Again, this is a merging of R&B, but we start getting Motown. We start getting black musicians being able to have popular music that they're able to capitalize off of. And I'm using capital in the like literal money sense of the word. Uh, if you look at this list of successful groups that came out of Motown, the majority of them are going to be black-led groups. And so we're getting to a point where there's starting to be a little bit of equity. We're still not going to get to equity, <laughs> but we're starting to at least give people a little bit of their dues. Motown started as an independent label. Uh, now we would consider it a genre unto itself. Um, but this was again really revolutionary way of blending different parts of music together into a very specific sound um, and again it ends up spreading all across the country it became popular out of Detroit they're recording in Detroit but then it's spreading and you start getting groups from different parts of the country coming together on the white side of things we have folk music now folk music um, was kind of started by the kind of folk tradition of same thing you get folk stories they're things that are passed down mainly oral traditions but folk music in the u.s tends to be again while its roots may be in oral traditions um it tends to be popularized by uh white people who are using it as a means of social activism if we look at the list of people here joan baez arlo guthrie phil ox and bob dylan they are all white folk, especially, uh, and we also have Pete Seeger. Now, Pete Seeger uses a lot of black gospel songs um, in his music and popularizes them. We Shall Overcome. The most popular recording of We Shall Overcome is by Pete Seeger in terms of units sold and money made. Um, and while they are focusing on social activism, it is white people profiting <laughs> off of um black music again. Um, Pete Seeger was so influential that in 2006, Bruce Springsteen uh, recorded an album of songs that were made popular by Pete Seeger, the Seeger Sessions, and he toured uh, that album and then released a double recorded live album of his tour. Um, and so folk music addresses for a white audience these social ills. Um, but again, it's made by white people for white people and it's kind of appropriating a black music and culture in a way that's palatable to and especially folk music tended to be listened to in an urban setting by um educated white people in rural settings tends to be played more in that oral tradition being played by untrained musicians and again we have a resurgence of folk music that happens in the 2000s um but again, it tends to kind of center around um, kind of repackaging these traditions. Um, folk rock merges 
those social activist tendencies with rock music. Newport Folk Festival, Newport, Rhode Island, is where Dylan went electric. Um, when he plugged into an amp, it was uh, so revolutionary that Mr. Good Old Pete Seeger uh, went, grabbed an axe, and tried to cut the electricity to Mr. Dylan's um, guitar. Later, he claimed that he was trying to kill a squirrel that was chewing on said electrical wire. I'm not sure anyone actually believed that. But while that was revolutionary at the time, folk music being played on electric instruments is kind of par for the course these days. Um, again, folk music does tend to be rooted in addressing social ills, um, even in contemporary times. Um, thinking about, oh my God, Charlie Darwin, uh, which came out from, again, uh, Providence, Rhode Island-based band, um, whose name I can't remember right this second, but it addresses themes of climate change and things like that in it. Merging that with psychedelia turns into uh, psychedelic music that is out around the same time as this folk music. And again, this is society's in huge upheaval and so people are using recreational drugs as a way to kind of uh process what's happening to deal with what's happening and again um psychedelic music is kind of defined by um how musicians were influenced by those drugs now psychedelic music doesn't necessarily mean that the people who make them are doing acid. Um, it's now become a certain sound and it's, again, it's kind of lost its original intent. I lost its original place where it's come from, but it was rooted in this time that was influenced by psychedelic drugs, uh, things like LSD, uh, which were taken at the time. Um, in some cases, people believed that this was a way that they were going to be able to um, change how we thought about the world and bring on a new era. That didn't happen, sadly. As rock becomes more mainstream, as everything, again, gets more and more steps removed from where it started, we have this continual trying of push the envelope. So in the 70s, people are pushing the envelope with punk. You can do anything with three chords. And again, this idea that untrained people can break in um, it's challenging commercialism. We get in the U.S. We've got the Ramones, Blondies, the Sex Pistols. Well, sorry, the Sex Pistols is the U.K. and Buzzcocks U.K. So in the U.S. we got Ramones and Blondie, based out of CBGB in New York. In the U.K. we have people like Sex Pistols and the Buzzcocks. So that's in the 70s. And then as, again, things keep going on, we get Hardcore down in D.C. In the 80s and in the 90s we get Straight Edge. Emo started from hardcore DC punk bands, believe it or not. Um, and again, as w one thing you'll notice, as things march on, they become kind of divorced from the, where they came from originally. Um, in the 90s, we get grunge. Where again, we're trying to kind of bring the lo-fi back into the sound. We get Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Hole, Soundgarden. These guys are all based out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and they're, again, trying to challenge the idea that you have to be with a major label, that you have to have a particular sound, that, you know, you're going to be made big by an A&R guy pushing you on the radio. I'll explain what A&R is in a little bit. Um, ironically, Nirvana gets picked up by a major label, makes it huge, goes on MTV, um, which is pretty much what these kinds of suddenly becoming massive is what leads to Kurt Cobain um, kind of be feeling disillusioned, um, spiraling into worse and worse depression, and ultimately taking his life. Um, again, we get alternative rock, becomes big in the 90s. Punk gets merged with pop music. We get pop punk. You get Green Day, you get Blink-182. Rancid takes that pop punk and mixes it with ska, which is coming out of, uh, like, Jamaican dance houses. Again, it's taking that kind of Jamaican music culture and making it um, palatable to a white audience. And ska was huge in the 90s. 
Um, I'm remembering learning how to swing dance. Oh. In the 90s, we also get Riot Girl. So again, we are taking that. It's kind of coming out of the same area as grunge. A lot of people who are uh, involved in Riot Girl are actually friends with people in grunge. But it's prioritizing feminist issues and it's fronted by women. Um, this is where we get girls to the front. The fact that, um, again, mirroring societal issues, when we have mainstream punk music, mainstream grunge music, um, it's a very male-dominated space and it is physically unsafe for many women to be in. So if women want to enjoy a punk show, they're concerned about being drawn into a mosh pit, being drawn into a circle pit, and being beaten. Um, having their physical safety um, threatened, never mind the fact that um, when you are a female in a large environment like that, you have to worry about making sure, do you do you stay sober if you drink? Is there anything that's been put in your drink? So these issues were brought to the forefront by people in the Riot Girl movement who wanted to create the same loud, fast, heavy music as their peers, but not be physically threatened um, within the spaces when they were doing it. So that's where you get bands like Bikini Kill, Slater Kinney still go into the stay, um, Bratmobile, and zines become a really important part of the Riot Girl um, kind of movement. So if anyone's interested in zines, I would love to talk to you at length about those. So while we've got this stuff going on in the 90s in kind of white influenced and white led music, meanwhile, we've got parallel hip hop, which is taking R&B and we are starting to kind of have a black led strain of commercialized music that is in parallel to what's happening in rock and roll. So obviously hip hop uh, includes rapping. We have DJs starting to become um, people who are popular in and of themselves um, and not DJs as in a radio DJ, but in DJs in the hip hop meeting. Um, in the 80s and 90s, you start having a real change in terms of street culture and street clothing. Uh, graffiti, street art becomes huge. Uh, break dancing. And it starts off, like many of these things, by being driven by a feeling that they want to break through this hierarchy of the music industry. And that by using non-professionalism and by taking the music back into the streets, that they can break the grasp of the music industry. Again, if you have this history and tradition of white people capitalizing on black music, if you're a black artist, you want to say, well, okay, bye to your systems. Why am I going to use your system? Because you're just going to take anything from me I give you. I'm going to create my own system that allows me to make money off of what I do. Um, you get uh, acts like Run DMC was one of the first huge kind of crossover bands that or groups, bands, my language is uh, inherently stuck in these hierarchies too. Um, and groups like Public Enemy. Obviously, that doesn't mean that there aren't white people like Eminem who are also hip hop artists in the same way that there aren't, you know, there are black folk musicians. It's just that tends to be dominated by one or the other. And again, being concerned with the way that these structures then inherently give people or take power away from people. And I think, again, looking at how our society has interacted with hip hop and rap music uh, tells us a lot about society. Again, people like Tupac were seen as celebrating um, issues in society around gang violence, when in fact he was trying to call attention to what was happening to young men like himself in these communities. And so, while you're addressing gang violence, especially um, when you look at the recording industry and the way that it was framed within um, kind of white dominated radio, that it was creating violence or glamorizing violence rather than saying, no, we're just talking frankly about what's happening. And if you decide that that's glamorizing, that says a lot more about you than it does about me. 
That isn't to say, again, that there aren't instances when someone is glamorizing violence, but that as a rule, um, we've kind of looked back and said there's been a lot more fear than is legitimate to what's actually being said. And we can see that there's been a massive influence on culture from hip hop and rap. And again, um, this is where we get a lot of creative energy out of culture, out of parts of culture that maybe aren't monetarily given their due. Um, and rap and hip hop has had, I mean, if you look at how streetwear has changed and now it's huge industry, you see how it started off in the 80s. Um, the amount of energy and enthusiasm to create this stuff. And then it wasn't until much later that you're able to, again, using entrepreneurial stuff. So you've got your emergence, you've got your entrepreneurial, be able to profit and make money off of that. Um, and by foregrounding voices of um, the people within your communities, you're able to give voices to minorities and have it be said through your own voice rather than having uh, a black man write a song that Elvis sings about struggling in a certain community. Um, especially, you know, then it was more about rural communities. Now we're not talking more about urban communities. Um, we can reflect these origins of the struggling areas in America. And again, it shows the shift in where these struggles are happening, that now we have more urban environments where industry is now based in cities rather than rural. And so that's where we have people who are going to be um, kind of the system is going to take advantage of them. And now we're able to popularize that in a way that allows us to be exposed to new ideas, topics, and visuals. You think about music videos. I mean, in terms of um, kind of pushing the, um, you know, pushing visuals forward and pushing forward our kind of visual lexicon, um, rap and hip hop music videos tend to be uh, a great playground for playing with different ways of expressing yourself visually. I mean, think about music video directors. Again, a lot of them tend to be coming from um, starting off in rap and hip hop and then maybe making larger money working in rock and pop. And even if you talk about how we speak, a lot of how we like how people speak is you can look at it and see that it comes from african-american vernacular english and a lot of that is expressed and popularized through rap and hip-hop and then people like me say new phone who dis um i try really hard not to because i'm aware that that's appropriation but so much of our language is appropriative inherently because we don't even realize where it came from so one of the things that you've, I've kind of touched on is that how you view rap and hip hop often depends on your social status. It can be your age, uh, it can be your race and your economic level, where you come from in terms of an urban or rural environment. Um, and so again, white middle-class middle-aged people um, saw the way that hip hop was speaking about things as glorifying rather than just giving a voice to problems. And so while rap and hip hop has, again, we're talking in broad generalizations, focused on change and focused on social injustice and focused on structural inequality, um, that's threatening to a significant portion of the population. And so instead of identifying those issues and saying, wow, that's terrible, we should help change things. They say, no, in fact, it's, a problem of black violence. It's a problem of black on black violence. It's a problem of glorification of gangster rap. And so they're glorifying gang violence rather than saying, uh, no, people are growing up in a system where the only way that they can actually economically make ends meet is to um, join a gang because we've structurally made it so that they do not have opportunities through what we consider to be legitimate avenues. Um, so, you know, it's important to realize that we can, with some time, look back in the 1990s and look back at what people were saying and say, oh, actually, this is what was happening. But when you're in the moment, um, you're kind of colored by how the media is framing these uh, conversations. So you have 
an attempt to legitimize rap and hip hop through things like uh, Aerosmith and Run DMC doing Walk This Way. It was the first um, time that Run DMC were kind of exposed to this massive white audience. And they absolutely, like it absolutely blew up. And now um, the two, I always get confused who's who but one of them talks um he's actually now a comic creator he's actually works with um children to use graphic um storytelling in order to tell their stories um and he talks about the fact that he really struggled with the fact that they made it big and he spiraled in depression because um he was wanting to tell these stories to an audience of people who looked like him and then suddenly and you're kind of decontextualizing the music, he really didn't understand what to do with that. And he actually, he stopped being able to sing. He physically had the psychosomatic thing happen to him where he couldn't perform. He couldn't, like, he could barely speak. Um, and so they couldn't tour. And he realized, he kept going to these doctors, that it, there wasn't anything physically wrong with him, but that the sudden catapult to fame like it affected him on a very physical level so again these things can have the by suddenly being mainstream it can have all these other impacts on people um tupac obviously we're talking about highlighting the war on drugs the impact on communities of the war on drugs that this war on drugs isn't um actually going to clean anything up but it's actually fueling the um school to prison pipeline and it's actually making sure that we fill up our private prisons with uh lots of people of color uh talks about police brutality talks about drugs and life in the ghetto and gang violence um and you know i can say that as a young person i can't remember my exact age when that came out I didn't understand everything that was being talked about. Um, and again, as I grew up and as I became exposed to all the things that um, he talked about through educating myself, you know, then you have another understanding. But just by exposing us to this music doesn't magically, sadly, change how people think. It takes effort on their part. Um, and, you know, this continues to this day where you get Kendrick Lamar having a call to action after Ferguson and being associated with the Black Lives Matter movement. So we still have people, and again, when Breonna Taylor was killed, um, a number of high profile people who were in the rap and hip hop scene were some of the people who were uh, arrested because they took to the streets and they said, this is not right. No, you cannot just kill people with impunity, specifically black people with impunity. Um, and so we still find that this is kind of leading social justice movements. Whether or not white people can understand it, um, you know, I hope that we have uh, gained some discernment in the past 30, 40 years. I don't know for sure, <laughs> but I hope that we have. Um, so I mentioned that kind of rock kind of took over. Uh, there's a schism between rock and pop and kind of took over the airwaves. But um, while we have other forms of music um, being popular, pop music as we understand it still does endure. And in fact, you know, obviously there's lots of... Um, intersection between pop music and all of these other forms of music and specifically i would say you know between things like r&b and hip-hop and pop music um and certainly rock music to a certain extent but that kind of very guitar driven heavy music does tend to be in a slightly different avenue the way that we conceptualize music so um and who is speaking in pop music can vary Again, I think that pop music now is much more diverse than it was when I was a teenager, um, which is I'm, nothing but good things can happen with that. Um, iTunes, you'll hear about the long tail in some of your other classes in terms of being able to um, kind of get more diversity of voices out there thanks to digital marketplace. Um, but iTunes played a big role in having pop music become the most sold uh, unit of music again. And as streaming services expand our accessibility, um, again, more voices can get heard. But again, what we define as pop becomes broader, becomes a bigger umbrella or a broader church. <laughs> 
Um, and I can't say Umbrella while talking about music without thinking of Rihanna. Uh, I would be remiss to not talk about country music when talking about U.S. American ideas of genre. Country music is, in fact, the most consumed form of music. And again, what is country? What is pop? What is rock? And what is country? Um, It does not tend to intersect so much with hip hop, but, you know, there have been cases. As something that appeals to non-urban America, I think that's also where at times it can get neglected by things like your textbook. When we think about music, we tend to think about what's popular in an urban setting. Country music is consumed more in uh, rural settings, more in suburban settings, ex-urban settings. But it is, in fact, um, the most consumed genre of music in the United States. It is very much grounded in America, though. Think about, yes, we have non-Americans who are who make country music, but they make it for an American audience, more or less. It is popular in other areas and other countries, but it's so it's uniquely American in how it styles itself. So even if you look at um, why am I blanking on the name of Nicole Kidman's husband, who is a New Zealander? who makes country music, he very much styles himself as a cowboy, as an American cowboy kind of thing. He talks, sings about American things. He doesn't sing about what it's like to be an Antipodian, um, which is another word for someone who is from uh, Australia and New Zealand. And so, so much of it is grounded in American-ness, and again, coming out of folk and rock traditions, that it can be kind of discounted when we're talking about music in a wider um, area and especially if we're thinking about it from an urban setting because so much of our industry has become urban we then start thinking that uh, urban settings are kind of the only place where culture happens which isn't true um very much grounded in american exceptionalism and how america wants to see itself thinking about things like the great outdoors um western expansion and manifest destiny um and it kind of thinks of itself as telling its trait, as telling the unvarnished truth, even though we're all telling stories and we're all romanticizing to a certain extent. Um, but it does have an influence on other genres as well. So I would be remiss to not mention country in this. Um, and so it does tend to appeal more to the Midwest and to Southern sensibilities. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't also have an impact in places like New England. Um, it's also important to talk about the role of women in country music in the same way that, you know, women in rock and roll. I mentioned Riot Girl. Um, again, it hasn't been until more recently that women have been able to really kind of get their due and get their pay. While June Carter was very popular in her day, uh, June Carter Cash did not make anywhere near as much money as her husband. I'll let you work out who her husband was. Um, but now we do have, you know, Taylor Swift started in country. She, then she became a huge pop music star. So obviously crossover uh, things there. The Dixie Chicks, or as they are now called, the Chicks. Um, they're an interesting case study because you can see how they were disowned by large portions of their fan base when they didn't support the Iraq war. And they have come to realize that perhaps the first part of their name glorifies um, kind of the part of Southern culture that is still rooted in the Confederacy and that still glorifies parts of the Confederacy. And so they've decided that isn't something that they want to have anything to do with um, and that they are concerned with social justice. And so they are now just the chicks. I think they are working out how that's going to work because somebody else is the chicks, but um, they are not going to be known as the Dixie Chicks anymore. And again, groups like Pistol Annie, which is a super group that is brought together uh, of women in country music who, again, want to talk about women's issues. Um, and they have become very popular. But uh, again, there's a certain segment of the population that's turned off by the fact that they want to talk about, you know, hey, sometimes men don't treat women great. Shocker. So realizing that all of these uh, genres of music have a relationship to um, 
society as a whole. So the last section, I'm going to talk about the nuts and bolts of the music industry and making money and how that all impacts everything else. <laughs> 